so much for your patience. So I just wanted to introduce a little bit about the cyber security or cyber risk community that we have in Sydney in 2017. And now we're 2,500 members strong across Australia, Singapore and Japan. And more recently, we've been doing these sort of virtual webinars to keep, you know, to keep in touch with the community and also bring to you quality content about what's happening over the world and also some, what's some interesting topics like today. So let's get into today's topic. I'm just gonna change the slide here. How Japan will benefit from, a, from establishing a national security agency. And if you think about this, if you think about the United States, which has NSA, and you think about the UK, which has MI6, surely these institutions play a key role. They play a key role in contributing to the cyber capabilities of their respective private sector. So I'm proud to introduce our guest speaker today, Giuseppe Kobayashi. He's an internationally experienced cybersecurity executive advisor, and he's a leading expert in helping international vendors in the Japanese market. So he's an expert in helping them turn around their businesses in Japan, and also helping these Japanese businesses expand in places like the US, Singapore, and Australia. So please, if you are looking for some advice, please feel free to reach out to Giuseppe Kobayashi after the webinar as well. He has also previously held some chief strategy officer roles at Accenture, Symantec, and FireEye. So welcome to the show, welcome to the show Giuseppe. And can you tell us why today's topic is so important for the audience today? Um, thank you, Stephen. Um, good morning, everyone. Hope you guys are doing uh, well and keeping safe. Um, the topic I chose is basically has a lot to do with the core uh, cybersecurity competence of a country. And uh, I would explain today uh, from basically the national agency uh, discussion, but it kind of comes down to uh, all the cybersecurity professionals in this community in Japan. So let me go through the scenario and give you a little bit of my thoughts. Uh, and uh, try, to, hopefully you can see the logic that's connecting all the dots. Um, as you know, um, in Japan, the National Cyber Security Organization is uh, very fragmented, but also not as um, complete and um, ready for the current situation uh, in, in the landscape of cybersecurity. Um, the most uh, prominent one is um, uh, J6, which is Ministry of Defense. Uh, obviously, the primary role of um, the national uh, defense is uh, to protect the country. And, you know, cybersecurity obviously is now recognized by everybody as the fifth um, force in the military. And it is uh, usually the first attack uh, vector. So um, there's about a little less than 500 people in uh, Japanese J6, uh, and that's fine, but it's um, not as uh, well uh, equipped, uh, mainly because uh, there's a tremendous um, uh, so-called pride and also a barrier to dealing with uh, international uh, knowledge sharing. Um, it seems like it's very protective. It's of its own skill set to outside of Japan. So, based on that uh, hesitation, they do not interact a lot with uh, other uh, foreign uh, allies together on uh, these type of activities. So that's one um, agency, and there is the NISC, uh, Japanese uh, National. Uh, uh, information and uh, security environment. Sorry about that. And um, also, um, there are a few more smaller agencies like IPA and so on, which are more IT oriented uh, computer associations. Now, that's fine in, in its sense, but uh, there's no uh, so called formal uh, government uh, agency that really manages all of cybersecurity. Uh, in U.S., you see NSA managing the government and the security of the national interest. Uh, then there's FBI and CIA. So 
I would, at the moment, I would classify the, the situation in Japan as very inadequate in the cybersecurity readiness as a country. Then the second point that uh, is related to that is, um, um, if you know how it breaches are discovered uh, in the US, 70% of breaches are uh, basically informed by the FBI to the companies that are breached. Uh, it's very hard, in most cases, it's very hard to understand that you are being be breached. Um, FBI has an extensive security network and monitoring that can see that there are lots of activities going on and they can pinpoint exactly where that information came from. So they are mostly the largest um, informant of uh, breach to uh, commercial enterprises. Sorry. So, so it's 70 70% 70 informed by the FBI. Right, so it right. sounds like in Japan, we don't have an organization which is informing these private enterprises about breaches that are occurring. Correct. Correct. So, wow. so yeah. And you know what you don't know, you don't know. And if you can't find out by yourself, obviously nobody's going to tell you. So uh, in addition to telling you what happened, um, they will also, also help you out in a certain background and context of the breach, how it happened or how it can happen and so on. So they're very helpful you figuring out what really happened and what, how to uh, control the damages and the reason mm -hmm. why you were breached. Uh, that's more important uh, because it could continue on. So that's the second reason why these uh, agencies do help commercial enterprises, not just the national government. And the third point is uh, related to all of you uh, is that it's a um, nurturing environment for high skilled cybersecurity professionals. If you look at a map of where all the cybersecurity specialists are in the United States, uh, I would say at least half of those people are in Washington DC area. Uh, most of the security companies have a very large intelligence and security monitoring operations around Washington DC. There's a good reason for that. That's because uh, these uh, uh, resources live in that area because they have at some point worked for the government. And um, for example, one of the major um, uh, corporation in Japan, uh, Sony, uh, has a very large global security operations center in Washington, DC, uh, headed by Richard Hale, former C, uh, um, CISO of DOD. And um, he's got uh, 60 to 70 people, ex-DOD guys in cybersecurity running the whole operation. So you can see that these resources are mostly available in that type of um, uh, location. And well, so he's they, taking all the resources out from DOD and then put them into Sony's. Well, yeah, but there's a lot more to come. And um, yeah. you know, FireEye has a lot, 500 people there. Uh, Semantic has about 300 people there. There are many of those. Wow. So, so you like, can see that this is no coincidence. The resources are there and um, these people are highly skilled. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not happening in Japan because there is no central sourcing of these uh, professionals. So the national agency concept is important for the country first, but secondary, it will help commercial sectors uh, nurturing uh, good, highly skilled uh, cybersecurity professionals. It's not, and as you probably know already, this is not an academic type of training. It's basically follow the master. You need a teacher uh, whom you need to work with to understand exactly what it is. It's not written in the textbooks. Um, so you need to spend time with somebody who's very highly skilled to uh, understand uh, exactly what are they thinking and how they approach the problem. And also have a source of uh, very enriched uh, intelligence uh, resources that you can use to understand exactly what's happening today. Two of these components are not available right now in Japan. Intelligence is never to be found here. And second, you know, have the masters to teach it. Um, having a national uh, security agency will 
hopefully be a good start and the only way to uh, this type of thing. And this is a very similar uh, evolution of uh, security in other countries too. Uh, most, you would probably know about the stories of Israel uh, with um, uh, many of the security professionals in Israel are from the Israeli uh, military uh, cyber security division, right? Uh, you know that this is it's a very pro much a proven um, approach to raising the uh, country security uh, expertise. So I wanted to stop there and um, you know uh, get more questions, but the key was for me to let you know that that's missing. Uh, and what uh, I foresee is uh, there are some barriers into building this kind of national security agency in Japan. Um, there is an intent to, to do that. Uh, however, it will take a while. Uh, mm. They expect it to take a few years to get to that point. Um, some of the barriers are very interestingly Japanese. Uh, um, in order to build, a, establish a so-called agency, um, the rule is you have to take down two agent, existing agencies <laughs> to build a new one. Okay, so wow. obviously, good luck, right? <laughs> yeah, sponsors of the uh, agencies that you're going to take down are not going to be uh, happy with you. Uh, mm. So that's one problem. The second is to, um, you know, this is a market of uh, demand versus supply, and your compensation level is pretty high in this uh, community. The more skills you have, that more expensive it is, right? Um, well, there's another one that's very archaic rule that anybody in the ministry that you are working for cannot be paid at a higher compensation than the minister of that ministry. So that's like um, on the average, to 22 million yen a year to 25 million yen, depending on the ministry. Wow. Well, you know, commercial companies are able to pay to uh, high level guys at, at that level. So um, in order to get the best people, uh, and hopefully um, you will probably have to import them from uh, uh, Israel or from United States or other places, uh, it's going to cost a lot more. So there's a, a financial barrier that they have to change the law to, um, and this is a law, it's not a regulation or a policy, it's a law. So they have to change that. So these are is some that of the- Is going to take another few years? Yeah. So that's why <laughs> everything, there's a lot of these kind of things that are in the way. And um, I know it's a, a serious uh, you know, threat at this point, but uh, unfortunately uh, it, it will take some time to go over these barriers in Japan. Mm -hmm. so, so let's just um, pause and just recap a little bit mm -hmm. about what we said. We, we talked about the importance of the National Security Agency on basically providing a intelligence hub. And it's almost like it's created a Silicon Valley of cybersecurity in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. And then the, the benefits of that is that people go out and they move into private private sector and therefore mm -hmm. reinforce this circle of training. Mm -hmm. um, and then we we touched a little bit about um, the direct impact on private enterprise in terms of almost being like this first line of defense for a lot of these companies. And I think there are some there are some data points which point to how long it takes to, for a breach to for a breach to be discovered in Japan versus countries like the U.S. Could you tell us right. a little bit about that, Giuseppe? Right. Right. Well, um, you know, there are basically two types of uh, breaches. Uh, uh, the objectives of breach. Um, one is mostly everything's tied to money. So you're trying to make money out of this uh, ransomware or just stealing credit card information, customer databases, and so on. All are in somewhere it ends up to uh, monetizing what you did. Okay. So that's one thing. Um, these are more criminals that are uh, in that uh, sector, uh, mostly in. Um, I would say uh, areas that's uh, in the Europe, uh, uh, Eastern Europe and so on, that was the origin. Uh, and, and now North Korea is doing similar things, but, but, all of, but that's money. 
Now, at, this is something that they have to do a lot of uh, surveillance and figure out how to get the money by uh, planting ransomware. And you have to plant something that makes sense to that business, right? So this little bit of time that they are in um, inside your systems. So, um, but at some point you have to come to the surface and say, give me money because uh, you know I planted this. The other piece is um, not related to money, which is more political. These are the APT um, um, attacks and um, they are not, ex you know, specifically looking for money. They're looking for uh, knowledge um, and experience and some sort of non-tangible stuff in most cases, okay? Um, long time ago, mm -hmm. used to be uh, blueprints of your new product or, you know, intellectual property related stuff. Uh, that was long time ago. Um, they learned that it, even though they have a blueprint of your new product and they copy that and build it, it doesn't work. There's something missing. So now they want to know why you do that. How do you do that? What kind of things do you do to make them work very well? That is bigger value than the actual parts list or the schematic design of a product or any uh, uh, ideas you have. They want to know mm -hmm. the process, okay? Mm -hmm. So basically they uh, breach and they, everybody talks about breach uh, as an entry, but to stop the breach is one thing, but to be inside the, your um, uh, internals is uh, a lot different because then they have to figure out exactly where the crown jewel of your company is. Now, I mean, these are not 10% companies that you are, um, you know, uh, getting into. So you have to figure out where things are, what is valuable, and what can be something that's uh, uh, good for themselves. It takes a long time to find it because you don't know anybody. They, you can't ask them where things are. You have to figure out and you have to find a path to that, okay? Uh, typical um, uh, time from breach to discovery in United States is 220, 213, 220 days uh, mm. is, is the current number. It's, uh, it's going down every year by a few, few days, but still it's about plus 200 days. Um, wow. In Japan, uh, it's uh, about eight years. They are with you wow. for a long time. Um, first of all, nobody knows uh, because uh, you, you've got people who are who's in the interest of not bothering you because if they bother you, they get caught. So they're very mm. nice. You know, they try not to bother you. Uh, and uh, that's their intent. Um, so they spend a lot of time in Japanese corporations uh, trying to figure out things. Also, uh, you guys are in, in, in Japan, so you know, uh, Japan doesn't have a very structured organization and decision making. So it's uh, much harder to figure out how things are being done and who makes the decision. <laughs> Whereas in US and other countries, you can see the organization chart and know who is the guy who is doing what uh, in Japan. I guess, I guess if the hackers were able to solve that, they'd be doing the Japanese companies a favor, right? Right, right. And used to be the language was another barrier, but these days <laughs> you have Google Translate or you can do things. So, so that's a less of a problem and they're studying more, more languages uh, because Japan is becoming a very, uh, I would say lucrative uh, market. So they're studying Japanese more than ever too. Um, so overall, um, you are seeing a situation where um, these um, many of these are inside your company for a long time. And mm. most of the people don't know. Uh, I have so many executives tell me, oh, nothing happened to us, so we should be okay kind of thing. 99%, um, they are breached. But 99%, they say we have nothing. I've never seen any problem. So, hey, when you mm -hmm. say that, obviously that is a problem because you, do you know you have been breached? No, but nothing happened. So I don't think I'm breached. Um, so, so there's no symptom. It's a, it's a mm -hmm. problem. Mm -hmm. And just to your point before, when you talked about Japan being a more lucrative market for mm -hmm. these APT attacks and attacks in general, um, what about the Olympics? How is the Olympics? I know, I know historically that right. countries which host the Olympics see it 
rise or a significant increase in the number of cyber attacks they experience. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, um, used to be that the Olympics were um, uh, another highlight uh, from the point of political reason to um, make it look not successful. So there were lots of uh, political interests to um, cause some problems. So there, and that still goes on. Um, the other part is um, you can't stop the situation. So ransomware in the last three years has been becoming prominent um, attack, uh, you know, uh, threat, and um, you know you have uh, urgency to maintain the system. So you'll see more ransomware attacks, uh, so that uh, people will be willing to pay to get back the system. Mm. Um, it is um, a time where, as much as the country is proving to the world that you know we are a great country, we can host Olympics. The reverse is true for the bad guys. If they can breach you, that's their Olympics medal. See, we did. We are good, and their recognition in the dark side uh, is uh, certainly boosted. Mm. So it's like. A, uh, Olympics in the in the dark side is what they're doing too. So there's lots of these smaller guys who are trying to attack you just to make the, their names. And the more names they get uh, in the uh, pro press, these guys can charge more for helping other uh, bad guys using them to attack. So it's a great way for them wow. to get recognition. So. You know, those are the activities uh, that come, it's coming. And Japan is has been talking about it for a long time and it's been, um, everybody's talking about it, but unfortunately uh, it is not um, as ready as it should be. Uh, because again, this relates to a national cyber uh, agency type of organization. There's nobody who's leading the activity. Um, and uh, the uh, they also it's very bureaucratic. Uh, there's so many uh, so-called groups or agencies that work on Olympics, so nobody can decide what to do and uh, lead this uh, the situation. Um, the last right. I have talk, seen heard about is um, um, it's still not ready, and good thing was delayed a year, so <laughs> can buy more time. Huh. That's what <laughs> so what yeah. it works. Yeah, I yeah. think it works for those bad guys too, because they have more time to prepared to. So, so if that, if we don't have a national cyber agency here in Japan, um, mm. taking the lead role in providing the first line of defense for Japan, who's playing that de facto role now? Is it someone like the ISPs or the telecommunications company who plays that de facto right. first line of defense role? Well, at this point, um, the so-called the MSPs are basically the ones that deliver the be best quality and best service packaging they can do. Um, there are very few um, uh, so-called international companies that um, uh, have uh, these security operations outside of Japan, such as the one I mentioned earlier, that have these kind of uh, readiness uh, to some degree. Um, so mm -hmm. that's what's happening. Now, eventually, you'll see that um, this has to be uh, connected with not, uh, you need the cooperation of uh, network the infrastructure guys because you would have to monitor a lot of activities. So, laws have to be changed so that these agencies can manage and monitor activity through uh, these uh, infrastructure people. So, that's uh, one thing that they would have to really do. Uh, and um, you probably know that there are lots of honey pots and things that you have to plant everywhere so that you can uh, capture uh, bad activities and then uh, gain knowledge of what's going on too. Um, there's also a lack of intelligence agencies that uh, really can do this. Um, there's a tremendous amount of uh, intelligence uh, that's being uh, accumulated in many of the countries that are uh, specifically from incidents and so on that uh, basically ex explain who is doing this, how are they doing, and why are they doing. And this is constantly updated. And this uh, so-called national intelligence is, security intelligence is not there too. So 
that has to be built by an, uh, you know another group of uh, people within this uh, national cybersecurity type of uh, organization. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about like how far away are we from building a national intelligence agency? So if they said, uh, mm -hmm. you know, let's let's do it, let's let's go mm -hmm. ahead and uh, tear down two other departments and create yeah. a new cyber cyber agency, like how long would it take? Um, at this point, the, the shortest one I have heard was from a minister uh, of one of the industry, uh, ministry that manages these uh, is five years. And five years. Um, yeah, and um, they, they are very, the intention is very clear that they want to get this done. That's true. But okay. with all the barriers and things that go in place, uh, they said uh, five years at best at this point is what they're saying. Got it, got it. And so what are people meant to do before yeah. that you know, becomes a reality then? Sure, sure. So, I mean, you know, the only thing I can really propose and recommend is each individual uh, people here in the community, first of all, should have um, access and uh, relationship with people that are not in Japan, uh, international companies, international organizations to gain more knowledge about what's going on in the world. Because certainly something happens overseas are gonna to come to Japan anyway. So you've got to learn a lot and that would require you to uh, amass a lot of knowledge and, it, and you will probably get uh, connections with people who has a different expertise. So personal networking and knowledge building is extremely valuable for each individual. And uh, I hope during that process uh, for many native Japanese people that they would um, uh, elevate their uh, Japanese language skills, uh, sorry, English mm. language skills, uh, because that will be critical for digesting the information you're gonna get. So mm. um, if you are not doing that, you should do that now because even then the national uh, agency is uh, launched, I'm, my recommendation was to staff that with uh, non-Japanese cybersecurity experts, and then mm -hmm. blend in the Japanese uh, people uh, team into that, so you can learn from them. You just can't put a build a building in Tokyo and say here is a new national city agent. It's not like a cup of noodles that you put hot water three minutes you can eat. You know, it doesn't happen that way. So. Um, you would be working with many international experts to gain a better and organize this and that you will be in a better position if you are more um i would say nurtured and trained yourself now to for that to happen mm -hmm. and you know you talk about international expertise mm -hmm. uh, and, and you talked about how cyber is a matter of national interest mm -hmm. so is there any particular country that we have a strong political affiliation with that we should, uh, I guess, partner with in terms mm. of developing our cybersecurity capabilities? Right. Um, the only one that uh, is uh, that we could work with is the United States. Uh, we have a uh, you know treaty for many things, including, uh, you know, uh, security protection from each other and so on. Um, and because this is more co it's connected to warfare and all that uh national security issues uh you can't really do this with uh just friends uh, uh that uh, you are close to uh and uh, you have to have some treaty to uh make sure uh you work together and the, how you apply this knowledge to each other and the only mm -hmm. one that's ready to do it is united states mm -hmm. um, you know, we think UK or other countries will be good friends, uh, and that's true, you know, but uh, then you have to build a new treaty and then you have to think of everything else, which will certainly take another year or two to do that. So mm -hmm. um, it's best to append a new uh, so-called um, coverage of each other uh, for cybersecurity within the given umbrella of the framework that is being used today for national security, you know, collaboration. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. That makes sense. Um, and if we were to just, if you, if you were to leave the audience with one key takeaway from today's session, what would it be? Um, I would say 
you should look very much, you have to have a long reach to gain more knowledge uh, of cybersecurity outside from outside of Japan. Uh, so go to Black Hat uh, conference um, and or any other major conferences. And now you don't have to go anymore. You can do tele video, uh, teleconference, <laughs> I guess. Uh, uh -huh. but, but, you know, gain as much knowledge and interaction and get to know people on the other side, which will give you a lot more perspective of what's going on and how to think. So um, I think uh, brushing up your skill set is um, quite important. I, if you were looking for a, a change in your career uh, or changing your uh, job, I would look for uh, uh, companies that's uh, international that has good cybersecurity uh, setup and um, so-called admirable leaderships that you can work with, because that's basically what you're looking for. It's not just the company, it's the, the leaderships that you feel you can respect and learn from. So um, mm. I would recommend um, working with those companies, uh, working at those companies, uh, that would give you a better chance of getting more information and exposure. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And you know, the, the first question I always, you know, that I typically get, typically get when people ask about a new job is like, who's my boss? Who, who am I gonna be working with? Mm -hmm. And you're right, like your experience in terms of how you feel about the company, how you feel about your growth in the company mm -hmm. is largely determined by your boss. Mm -hmm. So definitely, definitely when you choose a company, think about you know, who you're going to be working with. That's right. Um, yeah. I know, uh, I know Code Blue has gone online. Has there, mm. is there any other security conferences that you're looking forward to attending that are based in Japan? Um, not yet. Uh, Code Blue did announce a little bit earlier, so you you can prepare for that. Um, most of the major ones are still go ongoing. Uh, Black Hat in August is still uh, in person. They have not changed that. Uh, RSA mm -hmm. conference in San Francisco in April, oh no, sorry, March, uh, was actually, surprisingly, they uh, did it uh, with uh, 40,000 people in the, in the uh, facility. Uh, I think two people got uh, Corona, but other than that, it was not that bad. <laughs> Okay, but but uh, amazingly they did that, and uh, mm -hmm. you know it was very controversial, but they did. At this point, I don't see many yet announcing. But given the cost and uh, of operations and uh, ability for people to under, uh, understand, and I don't know if you know, many of the new um, the webinars have um, real time translations now. Yeah, oh, wow. So uh, you have, so you don't have to go and listen and then later try to figure out what they said, but uh, they can do it as you, uh, they stream uh, real-time translation in the back channel so you can listen in different languages. So that certainly is a game changer for many foreigners attending these, uh, you know, uh, uh, places. So I would th see how many uh, new ones are gonna be starting to change this, uh, uh, conference attendance type of a model to a mm. tele, uh, televised or video uh, conferences. Mm. That's so good. I think that makes sense for sharing the message to a wider audience. Mm. Mm. Uh, and and you know, we're, we're just about out of time. I just thought I'd, thought I'd say, you know, what's the best way that people could reach out to you, Giuseppe, for more advice? Um, please um, uh, look me up on LinkedIn and uh, send me a message and I can respond to you for anything you wanna know about Japan or Asia or US on uh, more in the cybersecurity environment. Cool, cool. Um, any other closing remarks before we say goodbye to our audience? No, I'm uh, hopeful, this is a great market that you are in. Um, I, I have not seen a slowdown in the cybersecurity business. In fact, um, most of my colleagues uh, have been telling me that they are in the busiest time of the year, uh, mainly because of uh, what has happened and there's more demand for cybersecurity. So you are in the right place uh, with your interest in this uh, community and domain, and um, you will be well rewarded um, as long as you keep your skills and quality up 
uh, all this time and further that uh, you know challenge. Great advice, great advice. Well, thank you again for sharing your thank thoughts, you. Giuseppe Kobayashi. And um, you know, really, really happy that everyone was able to join us today. So I guess yeah, please reach out to Giuseppe if you have any questions on LinkedIn, any advice, and we'll see you at the next webinar. Okay. All right. Thank you all. Take care. Stay Thanks. safe. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye for now.